Um, welcome, welcome. And uh, by the way, there is the restroom down the hall. And to the left or right? Oh, okay. left or right. 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 Down, down the right. Right. And there's one more chair right here. Um, July 18th, 18. when you come here, we will be back upstairs in the auditorium. Mm -hmm. And uh, refreshments, yes, they will be served uh, up in the lobby uh, near the auditorium. Um, on the 18th, always Wednesdays now, not Tuesdays, Zishan Ahmed Slack and Kavli Institute. He's going to talk about viewing the beginning of time from the most remote places on Earth. Shortly after the birth of the universe, space was filled with a plasma that was red hot. The light radiated by that plasma has traveled a vast emptiness of space for billions of years, and this is the CMB, or the Cosmic Background Radiation. It is still visible in the night sky today, and we're going to have some interesting conversation on that topic. August, Wednesday, August 15th, Galaxy Clusters and the Life and Death of the Universe. Eli Rykoff, also a SLAC, research scientist there. This presentation highlights data from the Dark Energy Survey, today's largest cosmic survey, to explain how galaxy clusters trace the vast expansions of the universe and reveal our future. I hope you can come to both of those. Tonight's talk by Michael Bush. He received his BS in physics and astronomy at the University of Minnesota. He went to Caltech for grad school where he was advised by the late Steve, uh, Steve, uh, let's see, late Steve Ostro and Sri Kulkarni under a graduate fellowship through the Hertz Foundation. He completed his PhD in planetary science in 2010 at Caltech <clears throat> and did postdocs at UCLA in the National Radio Astronomy Observatory under the Jansky Fellows Program before starting as a research scientist at SETI in 2013. A population of near-Earth asteroids, or NEAs, orbit around the sun and cross or come near Earth's orbit. They are remnants of material from the early solar system that never accreted into planets. NEAs are important not only because of Earth impact hazards, but as objects of scientific research. Many NEAs are accessible targets for spacecraft missions. The population will be reviewed tonight, as well as efforts to discover and characterize NEAs from the ground, and potential future space missions will be discussed also. Join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Bush. Thank you all for the opportunity to talk with you tonight. So, I'll be talking to you about the nearest asteroids, but I have to start by giving context. So, this is a chart of the inner solar system out to the orbit of Jupiter as of a couple of weeks ago when I put these slides together. Now, this crowd probably knows, a lot of you know, that we are just now getting into the equinox here, so the Earth will move along a little bit in its orbit. Jupiter is out here in the night sky. Venus is over here. Mercury is over there. Mars is orbit. All the other dots here are the locations of various small bodies that are also orbiting the Sun. So this is the main asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. We have the Trojan clouds that share Jupiter's orbit in front and behind the planet. This sort of threefold pattern you see here is the Hilda asteroids, the outer asteroid belt that are in that three to two orbital resonance with Jupiter. We've got comets passing through. What I'm talking about tonight are the red markers, which are near-Earth asteroids. Now, near-Earth is only near on the scale of the solar system. So these are objects that come within 50 million kilometers, 30 million miles or so of the Earth's orbit on their own orbits around the Sun. So that's close compared to 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles from here to the Sun. It's pretty far away as compared to the size of the Earth. And it may look crowded in the picture, but that's just because I had to make the pixels big enough to be seen. <laughs> so the moon is a quarter of a million miles, 380,000 kilometers away. So when these things pass near the Earth, as some of them are doing at any given moment, they're typically several times further away than the moon. And overall, they're as thinly spread as grains of dust are on opposite sides of this room. So when I give this talk to kids, I have to explain that this is not like the Star Wars movies, where they pile the asteroids on top of the other. <coughs> That's good, because now we can actually see the stars at night, as opposed to asteroids everywhere. Now, the near-Earth objects that we see now are not primordial. They haven't been on those orbits for the last four and a half billion years. On the time scale of a few million years, they 
are be removed from their current orbits. So they have to get fairly continuously replaced, and they come from the main asteroid belt, mostly by gravitational interactions with Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Just ramping up the eccentricity of their orbits, and then they come into across the orbits of the inner planets. So studying near Earth asteroids, we can study at a very small size objects that were in the main asteroid belt. But even there, they're not 4 billion years old, except for the very few largest ones that are in the asteroid belt. Because early on in the solar system, Jupiter formed. And it scattered around the orbits of everything nearby. That's why we don't have a planet between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. The encounter velocity when asteroids hit each other is way greater than their escape speed. So the collisions are erosive and the asteroid belt is slowly grinding itself down into dust. So all the near-Earth asteroids we see now are remnants of previous asteroid-asteroid collisions. So these are various asteroids that have been, and comets that have been visited by spacecraft. I apologize, people in the back, can you see an object here at all? No. <laughs> that color contrast is real. <laughs> So there are a wide range of material present in the early solar system. Rock, metal, carbon compounds, which are about as black as tar, and water. In the outer asteroid belt, the carbon compounds and the rock were and, and the water were stable in addition to the rock and the metal. And that gave us this population of objects, carbonaceous chondrites, that have huge amounts of carbon compounds and water chemically bonded in with the rock and the metal. That makes them incredibly black in color. The near-Earth asteroids that we see that come from the outer asteroid belt get kicked in, they may have that composition. Other objects are more rocky. And a few are metal. Something like the asteroid Letitia here, which is in the main asteroid belt, it never comes within 200 million kilometers of us. It's 130 kilometers, 80 miles across. This is probably 4 billion years old. But you can see that it's lost large sections of its volume in collisions that blew up those large craters. Inside Lutetia, there's going to be a core of metal. So early solar system, you mix together rock and metal. You have gravitational and efficient air energy in your release that heats everything up some. You also have radioactive isotope decays that came from the supernova that happened nearby the solar nebula for a few million years before. We know that this happened because we can track decay products that are still around. But that degree of heat was able to melt things like Lutetia and separate out the metal from the rock. A few objects like Lutetia got broken completely to pieces. And thus the cores from those things, broken up bits of protoplanets, are now flying around as asteroids. So a couple percent of asteroid in the main asteroid belt and the near-Earth asteroid population are chunks of metal, as opposed to rock or rock mixed with water and carbon compounds. So this is wide range of material reflecting some pretty complicated history. Now, out of all these objects here, these three are near-Earth asteroids. And I'll talk more about them because we have the most data on them. The other objects here were visited in passing by spacecraft on their way to somewhere else. I'm going to zoom in now on this dot. So the largest near-Earth asteroid is an object called Ganymede. It's not on here. A spacecraft hasn't gone by it. It's about 50 kilometers across. The second largest one is Eros. But there's many, many more smaller objects in this collisional cascade than there are larger ones. So in terms of the 20,000 near-Earth asteroids we know right now, roughly speaking, Itokawa is pretty typical. And thus I have to zoom in. It's a pile of rubble, which is perhaps not surprising, given that this is the product of several cycles of asteroids running into each other and breaking apart and throwing debris all over the place. So we have what looks, in this case, is like chunks of rock from about 100 meters across all the way down to dust particles. Yes? What's the size scale across this? So this image was oh. taken by the Hayabusa spacecraft from several kilometers away. It's 540 meters from one end of the asteroid to the other. It's about a third of a mile. Now, a few things pretty obviously show up here and on the previous slide. One is these things aren't round. It's the largest couple asteroids, Ceres and Vesta, they're round. 
and people argue that they're dwarf planets instead of asteroids. But they're large enough, hundreds of kilometers wide, gravity crushes them to be more or less ellipsoidal. You get below that couple hundred kilometer size range, the objects start to have compressive strength. They don't get crushed down into balls. And so, you know, Kawa has this shape where it looks roughly like two ellipsoids that are themselves piles of rubble sitting on each other. There is as much pressure at the inside of that joint under 100 meters of rock as there is if you put your hand on the table in front of you or on the seat of the chair, whichever. That's very, very low gravity, 10,000 times weaker than the gravity in this room. And thus, you can have a pile of rubble that has very little strength. Maybe it's the compressive strength of flour, but it doesn't get compacted down and slumped. So in addition to the unusual gravity, there's other physical properties that we have to start worrying about that we don't usually think about for geology. We don't usually worry about electrostatic charge moving rocks around. But on the Earth, you can move a millimeter grain with electrostatic charge. On something like Yukawa, you can eventually loft a meter scale clump of dust if you can put enough charge on it. The solar wind is constantly bombarding Yukawa's surface with protons and electrons. So you do get some charge buildup. And then you can have stuff starting to creep around. We also don't usually think about shaking the entire landscape, although earthquakes on the Earth can do something like that. But on Yukawa, you can get something called the Brazil nut effect, which is a weird name, but it relates to a very simple demo. You take a Brazil nut, you put it in a container of rice, you shake it. All the rice grains will find all the small space they can underneath the brazilla, and the nut will rise to the surface. On uh, something like Yukawa, you can have a collision, say like the one that made this dent, and it can shake the entire object and cause blocks like this, 100 meters across, to migrate to the outside of the object. But the details of how that happens depends on the internal structure of this pile of rubble. And we don't really know what that interior uh, property of these things are, because <clears throat> the Hayabusa spacecraft touched down very briefly right there, picked up some of the dust, but it didn't study the interior structure of these things at all. And we don't have that yet from any spacecraft or ground-based observations. <clears throat> there is one other piece of unusual physics that we have to worry about for geology on asteroids. This is radiation pressure. So I'm talking about two different things here. The Yarkovsky effect and the yarkovsky okeefe renzvetsky paddock effect. <laughs> we call this York. But both effects of radiation pressure. So sunlight carries energy. It also carries momentum. So we shine a light on the surface, you have a very weak amount of a very very weak force that's being applied. You have infrared coming off the surface, well, energy getting irradiated back into space, that's also carrying momentum. The tricky part is different parts of the asteroid are at different temperatures. So you have the daytime side of the asteroid, that's the part that's in the sun. So you have outward radiation pressure this way just from the sunlight. But as the asteroid rotates, the afternoon side is hotter than the morning side. So you have extra heat coming off this side and you have a net imbalance and the object gets pushed. This changes the asteroid's orbit with time. Not very fast, but if you have an object that's a kilometer wide, it can get pushed by tens of thousands of kilometers over a thousand years. Over a few million years, you can take an object that's on a stable orbit in the main asteroid belt, push it a few million kilometers, then it gets getting perturbed by Jupiter and it gets kicked into the inner solar system. So, we're seeing all these mountain-sized things flying by the Earth on the current orbits, in part because of sunlight shining on them for the last several million years. This is really strange stuff, at least to me, even now. Also, the direction at which the asteroid rotates determines how its orbit changes, because it determines the push is this way, or that way, or because it's three dimensions, it can get pushed up or down relative to the plane of the screen here and change the inclination of the orbit. So it gets kind of hard to predict this stuff. If you, if you want to say where an asteroid is going to be in the future, you have to be able to say not only where it is now and the orbit that it's on, but 
ideally, you have to know its size, its shape, its mass, and how it's spinning right now in order to be able to predict how much radiation pressure is going to push it around. Then it gets even more complicated because of York. So this was, the Yorkovsky effect has been understood for more than 100 years now, theoretically. And it was first observed on artificial satellites in the early 60s. There was a project called ECHO, and they were doing sat early satellite communication by bouncing radio off of a large inflated balloon. The balloon's orbit kept changing because the balloon is very light compared to its size. So it gets pushed around really fast. It wasn't until the early 2000s that we observed directly on asteroids. I say we, that was Steve Oster. I wasn't doing this yet. The York effect, though, takes this to another level. The object's shape is not a perfect sphere or an ellipsoid. It's, you saw Yukawa, extraordinarily irregular. That means the net pattern of that infrared coming off can be offset from the center of the object. So not only do you have the force going this way, you have the force offset from the center, and you're adding a torque. So you can change how the object spins. If the torque increases the average rotation rate, it spins faster and faster and faster and faster. Eventually, this happens. So this is a computer rendering of the asteroid 1989 KW4. There's 20,000 year of asteroids. Most of them just have telephone numbers rather than names. So you have to have the name of the asteroids and then the, of all the other small objects. But as the object gets spun up and spun up and spun up, eventually it bulges out around the equator to accommodate the extra angular momentum. If it was a perfect fluid or a large enough planet to be crushed to an ellipsoid, it would just bulge out around the middle and, like the Earth does, by one part of the 300, only much more extremely. It doesn't do that here because it's a pile of rubble, so it has a significant degree of internal friction. And you just get this big equatorial bulge. On KW4, that bulge, if you go a meter off the surface, and the object's a mile across, one and a half kilometers, if you go just a meter off, you're in orbit. That's how close it is to break up. At some point in the past, it broke up. And all that material that got shed went into orbit and formed a satellite. But now we have a complication. I told you how your depends on the very small scale details of the object's shape. The shape just changed. Now we have this whole other object out here. It has its own radiation pressure forces acting on it. And then the math gets really, really horrendous. <laughs> and we're still trying to understand exactly how this works. But this quickly became clear that a lot of asteroids have satellites like this in the near Earth population. About one in six of the objects bigger than 200 meters across. So there's hundreds of things like this flying around the inner solar system. You've got bulges around the equators of the object and then they shut off one or in some cases even two satellites. And in the main asteroid belt, we can track back and see two asteroids on very similar orbits, one of which has very little light curve amplitude. So if you look at the brightest function of time, barely changes, which is what you get into a shape like this. And the other, which is much more smaller, but their orbits are far too similar to be explained by random chance. We infer these asteroid pairs used to be satellites around the larger objects, and they just eventually drifted apart completely and escaped onto their own orbits around the sun. So all of this is really fun basic physics, radiation pressure, orbital mechanics, complexities of rubble piles, which gets far past basic physics and into really annoying computer modeling. But this is not what gets the most public attention for the near-Earth asteroid stuff. So I'll talk a bit about the effects of asteroids on the Earth, because this is what gets the public attention. <laughs> so many of you will have seen these pictures or similar pictures before. Asteroids hit the Earth. Small ones hit the Earth more often, because there are more of them. The very smallest ones are a few meters across, or smaller, and they just make shooting stars. This one, 2018 LA has the telephone number 2018 LA because it was discovered by the Catalina Sky Survey in Arizona. The day before it came in and it flashed in the sky above Botswana. So Peter Yaniskins, who's a colleague of mine at the SETI Institute, is now in Botswana, going back and forth across the game preserve that is the drop zone for those meteorites with some scientists from the University in Garumbe 
trying to see if they can find meteorites that fell out of the sky from this one. This one is in Sing Sumbana in southern Yunnan. This image is from Thailand, but it's over the border into China. And people have found meteorites from that one. That one was not seen in advance. And this is just this month. So these things pose no particular hazard to anybody, except people taking outrageous risks to get meteorites. Larger objects can start to cause a problem. And many of you will have seen this particular video. If not, you've probably seen many of the thousands of other videos. So five years ago, an object 15, 20 meters across, so bigger than this room, hit the atmosphere of the Earth just around sunrise in the city, over the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia. A million people or so live in Chelyabinsk. There are a lot of people with dashboard cameras. There are a lot of dramatic videos of people driving to work and Suddenly there's a big fireball in the sky that's as bright as the sun. And similarly from security cameras like this one and cell phone video and so on. What do you do when you see a bright flash of light in the sky? Get on the cover. Thank you. <laughs> Duck is the right answer. But a lot of people run towards the window to see why there is the bright flash of light in the sky. Nobody died due to tell you events, but it was a very near thing. There were about 1,600 injuries, mostly from broken glass. There's a shock wave, it takes 30 seconds to a couple of minutes to reach the ground, depending on where in the town people were. One person got knocked down a flight of stairs and fractured their spinal column. We'd like to know about something like this in advance, if we can. We also would like to know about anything larger. Those happen less often. The last event that was comparable to Chelyabinsk events was over the South Atlantic Ocean in the 1960s. It was picked up by the early Vila nuclear test ban monitoring satellites. There was a humongously bright flash, but in the infrared, invisible, but no gamma flash. It wasn't a bomb. The Vila satellites and later monitoring systems see a lot of those. In fact, our best knowledge of what happened here with the 2018 LA impact comes from the nuclear test ban monitoring system because they are very interested in sudden explosions in odd places in the world. So we have good science as well as making sure nobody is setting up explosions. <laughs> the last time something much bigger than Chelyabinsk happened was over Tunguska, also in Russia, in 1908. It may seem that things happen in Russia a lot. Russia just has a large surface area. And historical records of things over ocean are very limited, which is where they show up mostly because it's pretty much random based on where you are on the Earth. There's scatter reports of something like Chelyabinsk happening over the Amazon basin in 1931, but that's never been confirmed because there were just real people with cameras. So how do we deal with this and with the larger impacts that happen less frequently? Well, we look for as many asteroids as we can and track them. So here are the three most active near-Earth asteroid survey programs. There are several others. The basic strategy is the same for all of them. You cover as much of the sky as you can, going as faint as you can. And ideally, you survey the same area a few hours at later and a few hours later after that, because that Few hour spacing is good for tracking objects on near Earth asteroid orbits because of how fast they move. If you're tracking Kuiper Belt objects, you want to come back every few days. But if you did that with the near Earth asteroids, you'd miss a lot of them because they would move out of your field of view and you couldn't link this moving object to that moving object. So the Catalina Sky Survey in Arizona, the Panasonic Project in Hawaii cover most of the near Earth asteroids that we find now. There's some work in the Southern Hemisphere to try to cover that section. So there's a problem, which is that all of these are visible surveys, and they're working from the ground. They can't look near the sun in the sky. There's a project called ATLAS, which is just down the road on Maui from Panstars, that has the goal of finding most things like Chelyabinsk with a couple of days of notice before they happen in the future. So that if another Chelyabinsk happens over another city, we'll have at least time to tell people to stay away from windows. <laughs> the problem is, tell you this, I mentioned it happened near dawn. It came from very near the sun in the sky. And it's called the helium source in meteoritics. 
there's this population of meteorites that come inwards, that come outwards from the sun because they were a mistake that made them back out. And we can't find those in the visible from the ground. We can see them when they hit the atmosphere, but that's not terribly useful for predicting things in advance. So this motivates going to space and doing asteroid surveys from there. There's one project that's been doing that for a while now, which is the Wide Field Infrared Space Explorer. So the WISE satellite was initially designed for astrophysics applications, studying star formation, infrared galaxies. Then Amy Mainzer at JPL went over to Ned Wright at UCLA and said, can we use your spacecraft to look for asteroids? Because it turns out that WISE is constantly surveying at 90 degrees away from the sun in the sky. It's not going to capture things coming straight out of the, from the sun, but it's going to capture a lot of things that are very hard to see from the ground. And also, it's working in the infrared, it measures the size of the objects, it measures the amount of heat coming off of them, it measures how bright they are in the visible, you can calibrate and get a pretty good sense of how big the objects are. You don't have detailed shape information, but you can get a rough sense of what you're dealing with. So NeoWise has been, the Near Earth Objects program with WISE has been working quite extensively over the past several years. Yes? Uh, don't in, in the uh, upper right hand on Here? the top. What, what's the reason for the strange arrangement of uh, the openings here? Yeah, that's intended to cool down the cameras, which are of course mounted at the bottom, as quickly as possible at nightfall, so that they can bring down the thermal noise just a little bit and go a little bit fainter. Yes. What's the best spectrum to spot these, uh, especially the carbon? Uh, so. That's another point where the infrared has, adva has some advantages. So the optical surveys are a bit biased. They find the rocky ones a bit better than they find the carbon-rich dark ones. So you are missing a few large objects if you survey only in the visible. The infrared surveys don't have that bias. They're biased in the other direction. It's easy for them to find things that are faint in the visible, absorbing all that energy and re-radiating it as heat. So there's a complementary role there, too. Now, upgrades to all these surveys are ongoing. There's particularly the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is getting assembled in Chile. This will cover the southern sky, which is currently undersampled, and it's also a much larger telescope than either Catalina or Panstar, so it can go a lot fainter. So it'll find more smaller objects. Right now, we're discovering about 2,000 Earth asteroids per year. And WISE will eventually run out of fuel for keeping the station, keeping the cameras pointed 90 degrees away from the sun. So it will probably cease operating this year or next year. There's arguments about if there should be a dedicated infrared satellite program to search for near asteroids from orbit. So W first is designed for astrophysical surveys. It's not going to do this all sky sort of approach. At least not a fast enough cadence. How about the Gaia? So the Gaia satellite is very useful for tracking where stars are, which is important for asteroid stuff because it tells us where the stars are so we can measure the asteroid's vision relative to the stars and get a better sense of the orbit. But Gaia scans the entire sky once every six months, which is not good enough for finding asteroids. So what have we found? Apologies if I'm leaning across the front row here. So the Efforts to address the asteroid impact hazard by finding all the objects really started to happen in a serious way in the 1990s. In the 1980s, Louis and Walter Alvarez over at Cal established that 65, 66 million years ago, a very large near-Earth asteroid smashed into what is now the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And that killed off most of the dinosaurs and lots of other things. This really motivated surveying for more near-Earth asteroids. <coughs> and particularly the large ones. At the same time, in the 1990s, CCD cameras became available on a large scale. And that combined with computer algorithms to more rapidly autonomously find moving objects enabled astronomers to much, much more rapidly survey and find near-Earth asteroids, as opposed to doing photographic emulsion and blinking the plates by hand. So the discovery rate for near-Earth asteroids really started to go up in the 1990s particularly the discovery for larger objects, because those are the easiest to find. For asteroids larger than one kilometer across, the discovery actually peaked just about in 2000. It's dropped way, way off now, because 
we found all the large objects. I mentioned the infrared bias, where NeoWise is a bit better than optical for finding the dark faint ones, that are large, painting the visible bright in the infrared. These blue markers here are the NeoWise team picking up the last few small ones, the last few of the large ones. All the discoveries now are much, much smaller asteroids. So the original goal for Space Guard, which is the name taken from Arthur C. Clarke novel, the official name for NASA is some long, complicated acronym, was to find all near Earth asteroids larger than one kilometer across and track them and make sure they're not going to hit the Earth any time in the foreseeable future. We've done that. Yeah. There is one one kilometer wide near Earth asteroid that has a potential Earth impact in the year 2800 E. It's called 1950 DA. It was discovered in 1950, got lost for 50 years. And then in 2000, they discovered it again, and with 50 years of data, they could run the orbit out to 2880 and then say, wait a minute, this thing might hit the Earth then. I still can't rule that out. But we've got 862 years to figure it out. <laughs> I figure we can probably get that done in 10 or 20 years. We are still doing astronomy in the same way we are now. Now the survey goal is to get down to the asteroid survey complete to about a 100 meter size limit. That's motivated by the impact hazard more than the science, because that's the size at which no matter where it lands in the world, we would want to do something about it. And then we have projects like Atlas that try to find smaller things before they hit with less notice so that we can think about those in more of a disaster response way as opposed to asteroid deflection, which we'll talk about later. At the same time as we're doing all of this, we want to characterize the near-Earth asteroid population. And this is where the stuff that I do comes in. So the optical surveys find the objects. In the infrared, they can tell roughly how big they are. But they still have uncertainties in the long-term orbits because the measurements of where the objects are is only so good, the measurements of how fast they're moving is only so good, and they don't know the details of shape and spin state and Yurkowski drift that I talked about. For that, we need higher resolution. And thus, the radar team, which I'm a part of, takes over. So we have high power radio transmitters mounted on large telescopes. This is the 70 meter Goldstone antenna in Southern California, which is part of NASA's Deep Space Network. So it's used primarily for talking for spacecraft, but we can also use it for planetary astronomy. And then this is the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. It's 300 meters across, with a hole in the ground that happened to be about circular and 300 meters wide. So Arecibo is still the most sensitive radio telescope in the world. The FAST project in China will eventually, hopefully, be slightly more sensitive for radio astronomy applications. But Arecibo has a, has a radar transmitter mounted up here. So for objects that pass overhead, we can illuminate them with the radar beam, and then we can take advantage of this huge collecting area. Pick up very small objects. This is very important for radar observations of near-Earth asteroids, because the radar beam spreads out as one over R squared going this way, one over R squared going the opposite way. So we can pick up a golf ball at the distance of the moon, if there was a golf ball in orbit around the moon. But we can limit it to a couple hundred meters at a quarter of an AU. And then in the main asteroid belt, we're down to tens of kilometers. So we're very good for studying near-Earth asteroids, but not so good for studying other stuff. We have an asteroid. Pretty pretty is fun. This is not a real asteroid. We have the object out in space, we can resolve it in distance from the Earth, just by the time the radar beam takes to go out and come back. And we get a second dimension of resolution from how the object rotates. And the side that's rotating towards you gets blue shifted a little bit by the Doppler effect. The side that's rotating away gets red shifted a little bit. So we can make series of images like this that are not actual Euclidean pictures of the object, but they can be used to get information on its size and its shape. And crucially for the impact hazard stuff, we now know exactly where the object is to limit of where is the center of mass inside the pile of rubble and how fast it's moving. So we can run the orbits out much more precisely. And we can also tell if they have satellites. It may be hard to tell in the back. There's a single bright pixel right there. There's a single bright pixel, a couple of bright pixels right here. Those are two very small moons orbiting this larger the asteroid 1984 CC is the telephone number. If you talk about the impact hazard, in addition to the science motivations here, 
you care about having three objects rather than just one. From a science standpoint, this is very nice because we can measure the orbit of, uh, of the satellites around the primary, and now we have the mass and densities of these components. So now we can start studying the properties of the robot. How much of it is empty space, and how much of it is rocks? And that varies a lot, actually, from one object to another. So what does this look like for the hidden hazard people? So case study from seven years ago now. Objects discovered, optical observations only. We're on the orbit out from 2011 to 2040. Initially, we have some uncertainty in the average orbital period. So if it's spinning, it's going a little bit faster than we think it is, orbital period's a little bit less, and it moves forwards. If it's going a little bit slower, orbital period's a little bit longer, it moves backwards in the orbit relative to our prediction. So not only we'd say it should be here, but it can be anywhere along this line, which happens to intersect the Earth at this time in 2040. So we say there is some chance of impact, but just a way of quantify our ignorance of the orbit. So 12, 18 months later, go and get more data. Better measurement of the orbit. 2011 85 will in 2040 be three times as far away as the moon. No risk of impact. Good astronomy. OK. <laughs> Now, I watch them if you're on the right side of the earth. I do. Now, what happens if we find an impactor? I already talked a bit about this because we had the event from earlier this month. This is impact that happened 10 years ago now in northern Sudan. Object was discovered 30 hours later. It flashed in the sky above northern Sudan. This occasioned a certain degree of political notification because there was a large explosion over the Middle East. The US military probably has the best data on that, but they refuse to care with anybody. <laughs> but we notified everybody this is, in fact, a meteor and not something sinister. And then Moe Shaddad, who's a professor of physics at the University of Khartoum, took all of his students, and they drove north, and proceeded to find meteorites. And Peter Yaniskins, who's in the back there, is my colleague who's currently in Botswana trying to repeat this performance. So, really small ones, you go meteor hunting. Some of the larger ones start running away from the explosion. The meteor hunters have different values than most of us. They probably run towards Chelyabinsk rather than running away. But at some point, things are large enough that you really would they, rather that they not hit the Earth at all. So I talked about how objects a kilometer wide can't hit the Earth any point in the next 200 years we're cracking all of them. There remains this probability, maybe it's 10% or so, that we'll find a smaller asteroid, 100 to a few hundred meters across, that could hit the Earth in the next few hundred years that we would want to deflect. We will talk a lot about how to move the asteroids if we have to. One of the ways to do that is called the gravity tractor approach. This is kind of Star Trek, but the math works out. You have your space yeah. You have your asteroid. The asteroid's gravity is very weak, but it's there. So the space ship gets pulled down. Newton's third law, equal and opposite reaction. The asteroid's getting pulled that way. This is a very, very weak effect. We don't pull, usually pull mountains towards us by standing next to them. <laughs> but if you're in free fall, it's going to add up over time. You have to send momentum out of the system somehow, though, so you angle your rocket exhaust so that it misses the asteroid. And then very slowly, you pull it off course. This might take 20, 30 years to pull you off by a few thousand kilometers and change an impact to a non-impacting trajectory. But it's very, very well controlled. We can measure the whole process as it happens. Mm -hmm. But it's got really strict requirements for formation, flying, and the durability of your hardware. And Bruce Willis needs to stay awake for a long time. <laughs> Everybody mentions that movie. <laughs> okay. So the other approach that has gotten attention has something called kinetic impact deflection. Rather than pulling on the asteroid, you hit it. You hit it as hard as you possibly can with a hammer. The hammer, in this case, is a spacecraft. Ideally, one that's as heavy as possible, so you get the largest possible amount of momentum. You run it into the asteroid as fast as you possibly can. And you shove it out of the way. The uncertainty with this one is, this is a rubble pile. 
<laughs> we don't really know its internal structure. How's it going to react? So the proposal is to test both of these approaches on asteroids that cannot hit the Earth and on any orbit you could possibly deflect them on <coughs> could not hit the Earth. You're going to create an impact hazard while demonstrating you're going to address the impact hazard. That looks bad. <laughs> and it's extraordinarily dangerous. So the gravity character deflection proposal was something called the Asteroid Redirect Mission. That was endorsed by NASA headquarters and then canceled by Congress in 2017. NASA and ESA are collaborating on a project to demonstrate kinetic impact deflection, and that mission is going forward so far. It has the acronym Double Asteroid Redirection Test. I apologize for the contrived names. <laughs> the goal of DART is to take a spacecraft, the DART spacecraft, and run it into a satellite of a binary asteroid called Didymos, which we've observed with radar imaging. So we know the satellite is there, we know the primary is there, we know the size of the two components. We own their mutual orbit. You slam into the satellite, it's very small, easier to move. You'll change the orbit of the satellite around the primary, also the orbit of both of the objects around the sun. But it's very, much easier to measure a small velocity change on this orbit of the satellite around the primary than of this asteroid around the sun. So the idea is that the spacecraft gets destroyed on impact. It may have a small CubeSat riding along to observe the impact. But that'll keep on going. And then we'll time from the ground with the Atacama large millimeter array, with the telescopes optical in Chile and Hawaii, with the Arecibo radar, how much the orbit has changed. And then we'll have confidence that we can move asteroids around if we have to. The project sitting led by Cheryl Reed over at the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. If you want more details on it, there's the website. Now, this is the only asteroid mission that is specifically focused on the impact hazard and nothing else. Far more commonly, we have had asteroid missions focused, some to some degree motivated by the asteroid impact hazard, but more generally by the science motivations, which there's a lot more to say about. So I had not, re I, 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 I realized in my head just how many there are. I keep being struck by how many there are when I make the slide for the talk like this. So there are a total of five asteroid missions that have happened already or are currently happening, and then four more to various near-Earth asteroids that are in development at various stages. So it's a total of nine spacecraft. Three past missions, I mentioned Eros, visited by NASA's Shoemaker spacecraft, which was originally near-Earth asteroid rendezvous near in the 1990s, so it's now landed on the surface there and inactive for the last 17 years. This is the other side of the asteroid, Yokawa, which was visited by the Hayabusa spacecraft in about 10 years ago, so 2005 through 2010 when it returned to the Earth. This is the other side from, of the asteroid where I showed you before. And this is the asteroid Yokanis, which the Chang'e 2 spacecraft from the Chinese Space Agency flew by in 2012. This is the shape of Titanus. We pass around the 3D print model. That's from the radar imaging we had done in advance. We did okay in predicting the object's size and shape. We didn't see this end with the radar imaging, so we got that wrong. I gotta go back and fix that. More importantly, we had predicted where Tutatus was in space before the Chang'e 2 flyby, plus or minus a couple hundred meters. And how it was oriented in space to plus or minus a few degrees. The spacecraft flew right there. 880 meters away from a four and a half kilometer wide rock. Wow. I am really glad that our predictions were right. <laughs> so there's two asteroid missions happening right now. NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission is on its way to the asteroid Bennu. This is the best information we have on Bennu's shape from radar imaging with the Arecibo Observatory. It's got the equatorial bulge again. And the blue shaded zones here are areas that are flat. Flat is good for Osiris Rex because they want to land on the surface to take samples. And you don't want to run your $800 million spacecraft into the side of a mountain or a lump or a rock or whatever. So they'll probably land near the equator. And they'll get there in August of this year. Now, this is the brand new stuff. So the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft is the counterpart to Osiris Rex. Cyrus-Rex is mostly NASA and the Canadian Space Agency. 
and it was a two is JAXA and the European Space Agency. And it is right now just under 100 kilometers away from the asteroid Ryugu. These images were taken on the 17th of this month and downlink on Monday. And then there should be more tomorrow if I call the schedule correctly. So these are direct visible pictures from the spacecraft, not construct reconstructions from the radar imaging. Yes? Excuse me, but how large is that rock in reality? To Tavis, that one is four and a half kilometers from one end to the other. So just under three miles. Three miles? Just under, yes. From the long dimension. Now, Eros here is considerably larger. That's 33 kilometers from end to end. Yukawa is half a kilometer. Ryugu is about 900 meters across. And then Ben was about 500. So there's a very wide range in size here. But the nice thing from the images of Ryugu, we actually have this equatorial bulge. Our radar shape modeling is right. Yay. Now, one thing I'm trying to understand is, is this a crater here? Or is that just an arrangement of blocks? The resolution here isn't quite good enough to say. I'll have to wait for the next set of pictures. And the Hayabusa team is over in Tokyo working a very rapid schedule, getting data from the spacecraft, planning what they're going to do next, and cycling through. Hayabusa 2 and Ryugu are 280 million kilometers away from Earth right now on the other side of the sun. So it's pretty much one set of commands per day going back and forth. It's kind of like running a rover on Mars, except no gravity. Speak of right now. They get up close to the asteroid, they will drop off various smaller landers, which will land on the surface, and they also will try to make samples. They also have what is basically a hand grenade. This is a very, very small kinetic impact experiment. It's not going to deflect the asteroid in any meaningful way. But they set up, the idea is to set up an explosive charge just above the surface with the slug of copper. It gets slammed into the asteroid and excavated. A small crater. And then they get samples from a few meters below the surface and from the surface of the asteroid. They compare the two, looking for changes in composition with depth. And they'll also start to understand how orbital pile objects react to getting hit with an impactor of known size and energy, which should help a lot in terms of understanding planning for the DART mission, which, as I mentioned, is going to try to demonstrate asteroid deflection directly. There's two other asteroid missions that are going forward to different near-Earth asteroids. The NAA Scout Project has to reassign their target because their launch date got shifted, so I don't know exactly where they're going. The Destiny Project, which is a small JAXA mission, is to go to the asteroid 3200 Phaethon. That name may be familiar to some of you. Phaethon is the source body for the Gemini meteor shower. Phaethon is weird. It's basically a comet, but it's all made out of rocks. It gets so close into the sun, far closer in the Mercury, that the heat and thermal stress actually break the rock into pieces and it sprays dust out into space, and that makes a Gemini meteor shower. So in terms of understanding, one way that asteroids get destroyed, visiting Phaethon will help with that. Because some asteroids do fall into the sun, or get very close and start melting and thermal cracking and so on. Other asteroids fly apart due to Yorp effects and reconfiguration. And studying things like Ryugu and, and Bennu helps with that. And then, that's in addition to the impact hazard motivation. So science is about two-thirds of what's going on here. The impact hazard is the rest. There's also a planned Chinese asteroid mission, which would go to the asteroid Apophis, which may also be familiar to many of you. Apophis is a complicated case. It will come very, very, very close to the Earth within geosynchronous orbit distance in 2029. It will not hit the Earth. But because it comes so close, its orbit is going to get torqued around by the Earth's gravity. And depending on where it is in 2029, down to the meter, it has a series of possible Earth impacts at the end of this century. So we can't formally rule those out yet. By 2030, we will be able to, because it will have passed that flyby, then we'll know exactly where it went. But in principle, a dedicated mission to the asteroid could resolve that uncertainty a few years earlier. So we'll see what happens there. I've talked about quite a lot of stuff, and they're going for a while. So I will stop and take whatever questions you have. Also, I'm going to pass around a couple more because they are fun. I will want all three of these back. <laughs> so that one's Tutatis, it's shaped. The other two are 2008 EV-5, which is shaped like 
okay. Didymos and like Bennu and Ryugu. And then an object called 2000RS11 that's a very strange contact binary shape. So, I'm not sure what order we should do the questions in. Anybody in the back? Very back. So, if I understand it correctly, is the Yorp, uh, is the more Yorp you have, the less Yarpovsky? <laughs> It's more complicated than that. <laughs> so, in general, the, both Yorp and Yarkovsky effects operate faster for smaller asteroids because they have more surface area per mass. And the surface area is what determines the amount of force you have from radiation pressure coming off. And if you have more surface area per mass, things can act faster. But the details exactly what Yorp does. You have to deal with the object shape on a very, very small scale. Yarkovsky is less sensitive to that. For York, something like, not really something like Tutatis, which is pretty elongated, but something like the spheroidal ones here, any very, very small change on that ridge line could change the direction of the torques. <clears throat> so we actually get situations where asteroids don't form satellites. Ryugu may never have had a satellite. It just rotated up to the point that it was nearly a breakup, reconfigured itself. And in Ryugu's case, it spun back down again. And now it's sort of a fossil shape. You also have complications because asteroids do tumble to a certain degree. Tatus is in this really complicated tumbling state. So the York effect pretty much cancels out. But radiation pressure, direct hours from the sun, still matters to some degree. So the math, you have to be very, very careful on the bookkeeping. In the middle, please. Um, I don't know if I get this name right, but Oumuamua? That Oumuamua. Long, that weird thing coming from... That was a strange one. Yeah, I don't know. So Oumuamua is not a near-Earth asteroid. Oumuamua is not even part of our solar system. It came in from the outside. It had a hyperbola around the sun and went back out again. It was the first time we'd seen this happen. It was expected because we see comets and asteroids get ejected from our solar system fairly often. Most commonly, they'll fly by Jupiter and then get boosted out to escape speed and just go out of the void. Oumuamua presumably had a similar experience around another star, however many millions of years ago, and just happened to pass close to our sun and now goes back off into the void again. The frustrating thing for me was that it was only discovered on the outbound. We could have done radar imaging of it had it been discovered a week earlier. Alas. Let's wait for the next one. <laughs> so the Alice's T project help a lot with that because they cover much more sky and they go much fainter. So they get to see things like that when they're still fairly far away from the sun. It's a shape of it. It's so weird. Now that Oumuamua has a very strange shape. Like Tutatis, it's tumbling. But Tutatis is elongated by about 3 to 1. So it's about the most we see for near-Earth asteroids. Oumuamua is elongated by 5 to 1. And I still don't quite know how you make that shape. There's a suggestion that you could make it by shredding a planet to pieces. But I've never seen that happen, so I don't know what it will look like. <laughs> and with a sample size of one, we have no way of saying that's typical for ejected stuff. So, would you really like to find more of those interstellar things passing through and study them in more detail? But that just happens at random. It can't really be forecasted in advance, unfortunately. Please. One thing that you haven't mentioned, it, maybe it's not related to this, but you haven't spoken about the, the, the danger of debris to, to uh, spacecraft near the Earth. I, I wonder if you have any comments to say. So, from the standpoint of near Earth asteroids, they pose very little hazard in terms of orbital debris. The problem for orbital debris for Earth satellites is stuff that is itself in Earth orbit. Because it loops around the Earth so many times that it is thousands of times more likely to hit you than an asteroid that passes through once and doesn't come by again for many years at a time. That said, people have had concerns about if we disrupt an asteroid with this impact mitigation technique, say the kinetic impact is overkill and completely distrib distributes the thing. Now you've got a very large cloud of debris passing near the Earth. And that could pose a problem. So it's a consideration in terms of the impact hazard mitigation stuff, but not on a regular basis. 
Now, overall, the remonitoring gets done very extensively, but that's almost all looking at bits of old satellites. Wrong place. Yes. Have the sample return missions, yes. are, are they going to tell us anything about the evolution of the solar system? So, we get samples from meteorites, which tell us quite a lot about the early solar system, but they're not pristine. They've been sitting on the ground for a long time. They rust if they're metal and if they're water. Well, now you have earth water mixed in with your outer space water, and your signal about this got messed up. So the motivation there is to get pristine samples, put them inside a sample container, and bring them down without any mechanical, as little mechanical stress as possible, which is still kind of intense when you're dropping through the atmosphere, but, but less mechanical damage and as little chemical distortion as possible. So they pull the stuff off the asteroid, they seal it in a very airtight canister, and they bring that back. It's been done for Hayabusa 1, to a very small bit of dust. Osiris Rex and Hayabusa 2 aimed to get a sort of kilogram, several hundred grams of sample. There was a proposal to bring back 30 metric tons. That was the asteroid redirect mission. But that would not have brought them back to the ground. That would have parked about mid-Earth orbit. That was motivated by things like space resource utilization interests, where they want to take asteroid resources and use them to make other space missions easier, which benefits from having lots of material to work with in orbit. But that's not active right now. Is there a question here? Yeah. What do we know about any consistency between like dimension, like volume size, and mass? Or are some of them like... There's a pretty wide range in density here. And we infer, therefore, an internal structure. So some of them are metal and they'll have a density of five times that of water. Mm -hmm. Now the density of nickel iron from meteorites, which we have a few samples around here, mm -hmm. is that of steel, it's about eight, seven point something. So density of five means that there's a pretty good fraction of empty space in that herbal pot. There are other cases like Bennu, I showed you the rendering of earlier, there the density is less than one, it would actually float in water. It then probably disintegrate, but float briefly. So that is maybe 50% empty space. Now there are other objects that are more porous. Some of the comets, for instance, Jeremiah Gerasimenko, the Rosetta Space Train orbited, there the porosity was about 60%. So it was 40% ice and rock, and 60% void inside of the object. Then there's a question of how is that empty space structured? Is it just every millimeter there's gaps and grains, and, or is it larger void inside? And that we don't know. There's been a limited amount of work with deep radar scans of penetrating radar. It goes much deeper inside than the air sea radar does. But that's only been done on places like the moon and Mars and Mars's moons, where you have spacecraft very, very close in. It's very hard to do that from a great distance away. It hasn't been done with asteroids yet. We go back to the back again, by the doors. Uh, the uh, images on the previous slide, uh, you may have mentioned, uh, how were each of them captured? I'm sorry? How were each of them captured? So, all of these are direct spacecraft pictures, optical images, <laughs> at slightly different wavelengths because of the cameras that are used. This is a computer rendering based off of the radar images of the object. How's the resolution you're mentioning that there's? So, resolution here is way less than a meter because the Hayabusa spacecraft was very, very close, only a few kilometers away. Hayabusa 2 was taking these pictures from about 300 kilometers out. Uh, this is 330, this is 245. It's now less than 100, so the images from tomorrow are three times the resolution, roughly speaking. And then the cameras on near were a little bit larger. The Hayabusa cameras are two centimeter aperture. So they're better than your eyes, but only so much better. Near had slightly larger cameras, it was a bit further away, but Eros is larger. The resolution on here is a few tens of meters. Resolution here is about 40 meters, if I recall correctly. This is actually the really fun one because the camera was ever designed for this. This is not the primary camera for Chang'e 2, which was designed to orbit the moon and look downwards and not deal with asteroid flying from one side of the sky to the other in 10 seconds. This is from a hazard navigation camera. <laughs> so the color here is false color. There's actually zero color information. They just color coded it to look like what the spectrum of the asteroid look, is observed to look like. So there may be color variations on here that are not accurately represented. On the other hand, 
the roll pile structure, we, they seem to be pretty well mixed most of the time. Diokawa doesn't change color very much. So this is probably not too far away from real color. So you described uh, two techniques or imagining techniques for diverting an object. One yes. is gentle pulling and the other one was slamming into it. Yes. Uh, what's the short answer of why we wouldn't land and fire a, rock, a booster? Because so, of lack of fuel or? There's a problem with coupling. If you have a rocket engine like this and you're pushing it into the surface, ah. how do you get the rocket to stay put? It's an inverted pendulum at this point. Any slight tilt off a of vertical and your rocket goes sideways. How do you anchor well enough into the ground to prevent them from happening? And that depends on the rubble pile structure, which is only constraining it to vary a lot from one object to the other. So the motivation for the gravity attractor deflection is to avoid that whole anchoring problem. It also becomes a stable control problem as opposed to an unstable one, because now you just have the spacecraft hanging above the asteroid, or the asteroid hanging below the spacecraft, part of the other. The kinetic impact deflection is a much simpler control problem. You just run into the surface as fast as you can, and then your spaceship is destroyed. But it's less well controlled because of that. There are other suggestions people have. There was an idea that you could use the Yarkowski effect to change asteroid orbits to prevent impacts. The idea was that you would take a bag of powder aluminum, and you just dump that onto the surface. The difficulty with that is it's really, really slow. It might take 100 years, and it's not all that well controlled either, because I mentioned electrostatic charge. Aluminum is really good for picking up charge. And now, suddenly, your paint is migrating around the surface in some complicated way. I don't really want to try to predict what would happen there. So these two get the most attention because they're technically the easiest to do. All right, go to the back again. On an asteroid like uh, Ryugu, uh, what sort of absolute spin rate are you talking about? So that varies pretty widely. I showed you 1999 KW4, the computer rendering on the satellite. That one is spinning every 2.2 hours, which given the density it has, that's right at breakup speed. And that's where the reconfiguration happens, because surface gravity has dropped to nothing. Ryugu is actually spinning quite slowly. So what's the timing on this, actually? These images were taken over a span of several hours. And from here to here, it's about eight hours. And you can see it's very nearly the same arrangement. So it's spinning at one fourth of breakup speed. Bennu is about four and a half, so it's intermediate between the two. So I, I talked about the York effects chaining sign where reconfiguration happens. We just confer that Ryu actually spun up to breakup speed near, very near it in the past, rearranged itself, and then spun back down. We don't know the direction of the orbitors on the surface right now. One of the things Hyperus 2 will be doing over the next year or a bit is measuring its ori the orientation of the asteroid very, very precisely. And they should be able to see which way it's getting spun up and spun down, or first spun down. In the middle. Um, I was wondering what the color chart, the down. So I mentioned earlier that's the slope of the surface. Got it. That it has some assumptions about density. We know about its overall density. But we don't know how much there's variation within, inside the asteroid. Mm -hmm. So it may be that there's some gravitational anomalies that would perturb this chart. But given the overall density of the object and how fast it's spinning, this is the slope of everything on the surface. Mm -hmm. So it's actually quite flat here near the equator. <coughs> that ridge line is an equilibrium state between the spin rate and the slope of the surface. And it balances out the gravity and the spherical <coughs> force. And you end up with fairly flat surface to deal with. But there are blocks scattered about, which obviously are steep in size. Over on this side now. Hi, uh, I'm sorry, I came in a little bit late, so maybe you cover this at the start. But uh, I saw a, a talk a few years ago by an astronaut, Ed Liu, who is uh, he's raising money now for, for uh, satellite missions to spot new So I talked a bit about the NEOWISE project earlier, which is the infrared surface that's going on right now. Ed's idea was to do a satellite project that would survey much larger areas of the sky from Earth orbit or orbit interior to the Earth to find <coughs> as many near the asteroids as possible, particularly covering that sunward side that we can't survey well from the ground. 
There's a proposal to NASA to do that called NEOCAM. It's currently doing tech development. Ed was trying to get the B612 Foundation, which he works with, was trying to get private funding to do a spacecraft mission like that. The problem is it's a couple hundred million dollars. They have not been able to get a couple hundred million dollars from private donors. Right. Well, his point in that talk was that uh, when he made uh, diverting an asteroid sound like you know, easy physics, you, know, you can do that, but the problem right now, or when he was talking again, this is probably half a decade ago, was that uh, we only know about 2% of the near Earth. Uh, so we're doing things. better, we're doing better than 2% now. Yeah, that's, that's what my question is. We found right now 20,000 near Earth asteroids. There's about 20,000 near Earth asteroids we infer bigger than 100 meters across that you might want to deflect. Mm -hmm. We only know maybe 30% of them. We have a lot of the much smaller objects that are 50 meters across. But we're still not complete at that 100 meter size. We're doing better than we were, but we're not there yet. It'll take time. 30%. But there's this tail of objects that are harder to find from the ground as they're almost always on the sunward side of the Earth. Those are the ones Ed is trying to get a spacecraft to find. And NASA is considering building a spacecraft to find. But in both cases, it's contingent upon funding. Either private donors who Space Force. so far are not <laughs> <laughs> NASA actually has the mandate on this. It's, it's, there is no military involvement here. So far. They're very strict about that. So far. Okay. All right. Is there a question here in the front? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. In terms of this stuff is written, uh, what would be the main reason for that ridge? Uh, somebody so, will have this, like, like two cones. So I talked about the Europe effect. What? So I, I talked about the Europe effect, how we can have torques from radiation pressure. If you take a roughly steroidal object and you spin it up and up and up, it will bulge out around the middle. And that's what produces these equatorial ridges. Now we get a different effect if the pole pile we're dealing with initially is elongated. At that point, it can break in half rather than forming a bulge. And then you get two pieces. Those two pieces can separate and give us a asteroid binary where the pieces are roughly equal in size. We see a few of them. Not as many as things where we get the equatorial ridge and then shedding off the smaller material. But they also can recombine. And that is going to give you something like Iokawa or Tukatis, this contact binary shape. So the model there is that these two pieces were once separate and then recombined. And they did so very, very slowly. And because the impact is so slow, recombination is so slow, as opposed to high velocity impact, it doesn't slump back down. And you have preserved now roughly left soil bits. OK, yellow shirt. What was, what was the breakup speed again? I'm sorry? The rotation breakup speed. About two hours. It depends okay. on the density. If it's a solid chunk of steel, it'll be a lot higher. Yeah. Okay. But if it's a solid chunk of steel, it'll still have tensile strength. So that's the strengthless breakup speed. We see very few asteroids larger than 200 meters wide that have any tensile strength that is significant. There's a couple exceptions. But you get to smaller objects, even a rubble pile, so a little bit of stickiness between the components is enough to hold them together. The record for asteroid spin rate is about 15 RPM. Wow. That is presumably a solid rock, as opposed to a pile of rubble. But even rubble piles, you get them small, they can spin fairly quickly. Faster than a two hour limit. In the back again. Is, is there any concern about um, asteroids that are out of the plane of the ecliptic? The surveys cover the entire sky. Okay. There's a reason for that. Asteroids that, that are even on very, fairly low inclination orbits, if they pass, they intersect the Earth's ecliptic plane here. They're, 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 there's an the ecliptic plane of the Earth's orbit plane here and here, say. And that's what potential index can happen. They can pass relatively close to the Earth over here, above the north or south poles. So that's when you'd be able to find them in advance. So the surveys cover as much of the sky as they can, and they don't limit themselves to the eclipse. So can I ask a human interest question? Uh, okay. Assuming we live 100 years just to be, how uh, worried should the average person be about all this on a daily basis? <laughs> in the next 100 years, not that much. Because none of the really large ones are going to hit the Earth anytime soon. We can run their orbits up that far. Bennu has a series of potential Earth impacts between 2175 and 2200. 
which we can't yet rule out. But what's well, certainly strict is that it's way up there. We should be able to rule those out for you pretty soon now. There remains this sort of 10%-ish chance that there'll be an object that's big enough that we have to deflect it. And that's something like tell you that's happened somewhere in the world once every it's a 10 percent chance in the next 100, 200 years. And then tell you this like events happen somewhere in the world every 30 years or so. Most of the time it's over the ocean, we don't care so much. When it's over a city, we care. And we try to forecast those in advance now. So we're dealing with this problem. We can hopefully have other people deal with all the other problems that we have. <laughs> <laughs> all right. One more question here. Um, presumably there are many more small asteroids than large asteroids. Yes. And I was up with some kind of power law. Um, if I were in a space station or in a, a, a rocket ship, I, I would be more worried about those little ones, the size of your little models. Is there any way to calculate the probability that we'd be hit by one of those? So, for those of us on the ground, things smaller than about 10 meters don't pose too much of a problem because they get stopped very high in the atmosphere. Well, that's where drop we meteorites. would be if I, we were in a space station. If you were in orbit, then yes, you worry about the much smaller ones. Is there any way to calculate that probability? It ends up being very, very, very low. So we've sent space through the asteroid belt and haven't gotten anything hit. You can send space through the gaps of the rings of Saturn without a problem, although you don't think you have enough. You can see any space did that repeatedly. The tricky part from the safety of astronauts is, again, the orbital debris in Earth orbit. Because one of these near-Earth asteroids has to do the Earth once every, in any, any individual object, once every thousand years, say. Whereas the stuff that's in Earth orbit with you, that lives around you every 90 minutes if you're in low orbit. So the risk from that debris is many orders of magnitude higher. So situational awareness tracking for the space station, for instance, focuses on stuff in Earth orbit. They do track stuff out as far as a couple times the geosynchronous distance. Beyond that, they don't really track because there aren't any satellites out there. There aren't that, that many satellites out there. And the risk of a collision is much, much lower. All right, I'll be around for a bit longer if you have questions you want to ask one-on-one. -on -one. One and I do want the others back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I wanted to mention is that Next month and through the whole year, we'll be upstairs in the auditorium. Mm -hmm. So we will have more space yeah. to sit. And then we'll be Oh, 